I had planned to have a Pastor Johnson fill in for me while I was in Hungary with our mission trip team a year ago. You remember that? We were all geared up for that, and at the last moment, I had to cancel it because we could not get a refund for uh, the money that we paid on that. And so I canceled it, and then the next week, we really had to shut down the church. And we were shut down for about six weeks. Well, obviously, he didn't come and speak at that time. And so then earlier in the year, we rescheduled him for this Sunday. Little did I know I would have surgery on last Monday and really uh, be laid up several days this week. And, uh, but God has answered your prayers. I'm doing so well. <clears throat> but I want to come back to the whole idea of uh, COVID hitting us. I believe it hit them right at the very beginning of your taking over as a sister. Now think about it. You're responsible for all the churches in Michigan, the American Baptist churches, and uh, like the first month on the job, you are slammed with a crisis. And we call that the baptism by fire. That's the way he's been baptized. And uh, he's going to share with us this morning. And if you would just give us an update on how COVID is doing throughout our churches. I mean, here it rebounded in August, and then we took a setback in September. Let us know how our sister churches are doing as well, and then break the word of life to us. We, we ask of you today. Come, Brian, give him a warm welcome. Will you please? Well, good morning, folks. It is, uh, it is good to be with you. And uh, the, the standing joke is that I started on March 1 of 2020. And before I even knew what the copier code was at the offices, I was helping churches figure out how to go online and do this thing called Zoom. Uh, to be fair, I'm, not, I'm still not even sure I know what the copier code is at the office because it's, it's, it's daily, weekly, definitely. Hey, can you help us do this? So we're trying to figure out how to do that when it comes to uh, our technology. So um, every church is different when it comes to how COVID impacted them. One of the things that we are learning, uh, and it's not just you know, like an ABC Michigan thing, it's, it's, it's across all churches, and it doesn't apply just to churches, it applies to organizations, and it applies to individuals as well. This principle, all COVID did is speed up the trajectory of whatever course you were on. Have you noticed a lot of people um, acting really dysfunctional during COVID? Guess what? It was already there. <laughs> COVID just sped it up. Some churches during COVID have done this. Some have done this. Some have done this. Whatever trajectory the church was on, it kind of continued in a way. Um, it just kind of sped the process up. Research is telling us that when it comes to the church the, the, uh, in America today, that we are living in a uh, 30, 40, 30 situation. 30% 30 of your church, again, this is across the board, so you may be different, 30% uh, of the people in your congregation, gone. Like, gone, gone. Not like sort of gone, but like gone. And here's, here's what we're finding out. There were a lot of people who were like, I just don't know if I want to be a part of that church any longer, but if I leave, they're going to notice I'm gone, they're going to call me, you know. COVID gave them a great exit because they're, everybody's online, and so I can slip out. And so people are slipping out, and others are slipping in. People that may have been um, unhappy here have decided to go be unhappy somewhere else. <laughs> and, and, and you may be finding some of those people coming in your door as well. So 30% of, uh, of the church attendance it's kind of just whoosh, gone. And then 40% um, of your uh, congregation uh, is, is still there. It's, it's rearing. It's ready to go. It's like, hey, you know, COVID uh, is what it is, but we've got a mission. Let's keep going. Let's not slow down at all. And then there is another 30%. Um, and, and, and those are the people who are, actually, I flipped the 30 and 40 around. I, um, so 30% are like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then the remaining 40% are the people who are, you know, hey, I'll be there one week. I may be online another week, and we may be up north at our cottage the other two weeks. And so the challenge or the struggle or the opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is how do we engage and draw those people 
in to greater levels of commitment, not to the church, but to Jesus. Because commitment to Jesus always translates into commitment to the church because he bled and died for this thing called his bride. So um, there have been, you know, we've got about 140 churches in our region. And my commitment when we came, when I came, was that we wanted to be about seeing renewal in congregations. I was not going to let churches just do this without a fight. How can we come alongside them, support them, encourage them so that we can see renewal happen because there is a measure of glory God gets when there is a resurrection that happens. And I want to be a part of that. And then I also believe that there is an opportunity for us as a region, we haven't done this in 25 years, to see church planting happen. Um, Why can't we find places in the state of Michigan that need the presence of Jesus through a local church to be born there and, and grow because we believe in, in, in that a healthy organism does what? It grows. It multiplies. And this thing called the body of Christ should be no different. So those are some areas that we are really focused in on, and we're just really thankful for the ways in which you're, I mean, you're talking about supporting World Mission and the goods. I've known them for years and just love the ministry that they're doing over there. And your your mission dollars that you give, not just mission dollars, but your mission presence, you know, this is a congregation that doesn't just send money. You roll up your sleeves you participate, you connect. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I want you to know that your impact is greater than it could ever be on your own. And that's the genius of this thing called an association of churches. Everybody brings what they have together. And somehow the total, the sum total is greater than the individual parts. And so thank you for the ways in which you are making a difference um, all around um, Michigan and, and the world, you know, our missionaries are literally all over the world, and together we are lifting up the banner of Jesus Christ in our neighborhoods here and also in villages literally across the world. If you have a copy of God's Word in, uh, nearby, I'd love for you to get it and turn to John chapter 2. It'll be on the screen, but it's also great if you could see it in your Bible. I want you to know that I'm not making this stuff up. This actually comes from God's Word. So we're going to be in John chapter 2, and so if you can get there, when we get there, you'll already be there, and we'll be ready to go. Um, John chapter 2, I want to begin with a word of prayer, because you didn't come to hear me. Um, If you did, you'll be disappointed. Um, Hopefully you came to maybe hear a word from the Lord, and let's pray that that would happen today. Oh God, we come to you today, and we ask that you would move in this place, move in our hearts, Your word tells us that spiritual truth is something that has to be uh, discerned by a grace that you give us. So we ask, oh God, that you would flip the switch on in our soul and illuminate gospel truth to us today, that we would be able to respond to you the way anybody would respond to you if they could just see you as you really are. Uh, Please move in this place, move in our hearts move in this church. God, may this be a mission outpost for the Waterford area in maybe a greater way than it's ever known before. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to begin with a question, and honestly, it's the question that, that uh, has the ability to keep me up at night. You ever have, a, you know, like there's something that nags at you that keeps you awake at night? This is one of these things that keeps me awake at night. It's this question. Why is there so little change in Christians? Why is it that those who profess the name of Jesus uh, experience so little change, so little transformation in their life? In other words, why is it that in the majority of churches in America today, I'm going to talk about the church in America, I'm not going to talk about the church in Hungary, I don't know what's happening there. I'm not going to talk about the church in Guatemala, again, I don't know what's happening there. I'm not going to talk about the church in Iran, I don't know what's happening there. I do know, though, that Iran is actually the fastest growing church in the world. There are more people coming to Jesus daily in Iran than anywhere else in the world. It has no buildings, it has no budget, it's led primarily by women. But the gospel 
is going like gangbusters there. So don't always buy everything you see on the news. So I think we've learned that over the last uh, couple of years, right? Talk about the church in America. Why is it that in the church in America we see so little change? That in any particular congregation, you pick the congregation, there is a small pocket of people that are growing, changing, and transforming to become more and more and more like Jesus Christ. My question is, why is it a small pocket? Why is it only some people that are experiencing that transformation? They may hold a position of leadership, but they definitely hold a position of influence because you look to them, you listen to them, you admire them. In some ways, you aspire to be like them, but it's just not happening in your life. And my question is, why are there so few of them in the church? That in the average local church today, when somebody has a salvation moment of some kind, they begin on a trajectory of growth. They start attending church. They are going to serve within their uh, local church. If they've really been born again, they may even say, Pastor, can I volunteer in the nursery? <laughs> they, they, they stop using their bowling words, except on maybe bowling nights. They start tithing, maybe attending Bible studies and other things along the way. But by and large, what you find in them is that this growth trajectory happens for about two or three years, and then it plateaus. And what you see is what you get. Oh, sure, they're going to continue to be a part of this Christian culture. They're going to gain more information, but the information may not translate into transformation. In other words, they are educated beyond their willingness to be obedient to it. And you'll hear them say things like, well, you know, hey, I was born a worry wart. I am a worry wart, and I'm going to die a worry wart. It's just the way I am. Well, well, kids, you know, daddy's always had anger issues. He still has anger issues, and he's probably going to die with anger issues. That's, that's just the way daddy is. Me and this microphone are going to have a conversation. There we go. <laughs> now we're cooking. And so we have grown accustomed to creating an environment that normalizes a lack of transformation in our churches. Why is that? And where did it come from? You know, I think there's some things we do that kind of support this idea. If you were to um, bump into somebody and you discovered, so say you're at Walmart, Meyer, Costco, whatever it is, and you bump into somebody and you discover that they're a Christian, do you know there's two questions that you ask them? Like, all of us do this. And the first question we ask them is, how long have you been a Christian? Now, I, I don't know. I just think in other countries, they don't ask that question. Why do we ask this question? How long have you been a Christian? Well, we, we make some assumptions about them based on the answer that they tell us. If they say, I've been a Christian for 30 years, we go, wow, you must really be like Jesus. But if they say, well, you know, I've only been a Christian for about a year, what, what do we think inside? Oh, the cute little baby Christian. <laughs> Paint your cheeks. You've got so far to go, you cute little baby Christian. Why do we do that? Because there is an assumption that we believe in the American church that is a lie. And here's how it goes. We assume time on the job equals transformation. That the longer I've been in this, the more like Jesus I must be. So, oh, you've been a Christian for 30 years? You've got a lot of time on the job. And we, listen, we honor this whole time on the job phenomenon. Growing up in an American Baptist church in Illinois, a small farming town, we would have um, uh, these pins that you could earn if you had at or near perfect attendance in Sunday school. Maybe some of you had that experience along the way as well. Well, see, I grew up in a home where my dad believed that unless I was hemorrhaging blood beyond a point that a tourniquet couldn't stop it, 
you were going to be in church. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I, I jokingly tell some people that I had a drug problem as a child. I was drugged to church weekly. Some are so, you know, freaked out by the first part of that that they missed the joke on the other end, and they're, you know, asking me, you know, are, are you part of Celebrate Recovery, Pastor? You know, they're like, no, no, no. And so, so I would get Sunday school pins, and we had some people in my church growing up, they had more metal on their jacket than the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff. Like, you would be, you'd see them walk by. There they go. You know, because what do we do? We celebrate and we honor time on the job and we assume time on the job equals transformation. So when someone says they've been a Christian for one year, you cute little baby Christian. 30 years, whoa, you must really know Jesus. Now, one of the indictments about the American church right now is based on you know, what I see, other people see, not just American Baptists, but, but American Christianity as a whole. More often than not, when somebody says, I've been a Christian for 30 years, their life transformation would tell you that they have been a year one Christian 30 times in a row. They're not really growing. They're not really changing. They're not really experiencing transformation. They're fundamentally the same person they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They've got more information, but they don't have any more transformation. You know what the second question we ask somebody when we find out they're a Christian? What church do you go to? Now, you're in church right now. So when I ask you the question, why do you ask that question? You can't lie because lightning will come through. (laughs) You know why we ask that question? We ask that question because we're trying to figure out, are you not going anywhere? And if you're not going anywhere, maybe you want to come and be a part of my team. And maybe you're not happy where you are, so we can steal you from that team and bring you onto our team so that you can be a part of this cool thing that God is doing here at Bethany. So we've got this phenomenon whereby we see so little transformation happen in our churches. And the question is, what do we do about it? How do we see something different emerge? And I think that Um, the first miracle Jesus performs at Cana in Galilee actually gives us a little bit of a glimpse on what the remedy is to this issue that we are experiencing in the church. So if you have uh, your Bible open, you are ready to go. We're going to jump in there together. John chapter uh, 2, beginning in verse 1. And me and this clicker are going to see how this works. Ta-da! Verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Verse 2, this is equally as important. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Brian, why is that important? Because there is this this lie, this fear that, um, that exists in most Christians today, that, you know what, Brian, if I really go all in with Jesus, if I really decide that I want to be everything he wants me to be, that the rest of the world is going to look at me as a Jesus freak, Bible thumper, you know, holy roller, and they're not going to want me to be around them at all. And yet, when you read the Gospels, this is what you'll read. When you read in the Gospels, you'll find that people who were far from God wanted to be around Jesus. And Jesus wanted to be around them. These people so far from God suddenly felt comfortable around Jesus. And Jesus felt comfortable around them. Now listen, don't avoid being all that Jesus wants you to be so that you can be liked by other people. We don't live for the applause of men. The scripture says that man loves darkness more than light. But there is something attractive. It's like salt, Jesus says. It's like light. When all grace and all truth converge, and there, people far from God suddenly feel welcome to the table. So uh, he's been, uh, Jesus is able to, to go to the wedding. He's been invited. The disciples have been invited to the wedding as well. Verse 3, it says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to them, they have no more wine. Now, if you were a student of first century culture, when I read the phrase, they had no more wine, I would have known that you were a student of first century culture because here's what your response would have been. Huh? <laughs> you would have freaked out. Do you know why you would have freaked out? Because that's a freak out moment in first century culture. In first century culture, they live by what's called an honor-shame culture. 
you are trying everything you can to be revered and honored uh, within the community. You wanted the community to put you in the honor category. And people would come and they would want your opinion on things. They would listen to you. They would revere you. What you did not want is to end up in the shame category. Because if you ended up in the shame category uh, by your family background, by a, a misstep on your part, by a, a huge uh, holy blemish that you've made somehow, if you were in the shame category, people were ashamed of you. Family would disassociate with you. You would be a functional leper. You're walking on one side of the street, they're walking on the other side of the street because you are in the shame category. It takes a whole lot of work and a whole lot of effort to end up in this honor category. And with one misstep, you're out. If you end up in the shame category, it's almost impossible to get out of that category. I said, Brian, why are you bringing that up? Because if you ran out of wine at a wedding, you did not pass go. You did not collect $200. You went straight to the shame category category in that culture it was such a big deal jewish historians actually tell us that if you ran out of wine at a wedding you could be sued could you imagine turning on judge judy tomorrow morning <laughs> and the case is they ran out of wine at the wedding so so, so this is a big deal and and jesus mother is like whoa whoa you know hey hey, hey. They, they, they they have no more wine elbow 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 wink 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 i know what you can do Time to fix this, Jesus. We got a problem. Yo, you can solve it. Verse 4. Here's his response. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Doesn't it sound like he's talking back to his mama? Now, we know that he's not because you can't be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world if you just sinned by talking back to mama. So what's going on here? How do we understand this dynamic? Jesus knows that Mary basically is a great picture for everybody else in the world. There's a problem. Jesus, I have a problem, and you've got the ability to fix it. So fix it. I have an inconvenience. Fix it. I've got a problem. Solve it. You've got the ability. You've got the power to make my life better. Do it. And Jesus is hesitant here. And the reason Jesus is hesitant is because he knows the human heart. And here's what he knows about the human heart. That there exists in you and there exists in me an utter fascination and a desire to see Jesus perform miracles that have a shelf life. You say, well, why shelf life? Well, so, you know, we read in the Gospels that Jesus made a blind person see. Spoiler alert, at some point his eyes closed again and they never opened. The deaf person who could hear, eventually it would be silent in his ears again. The person who was lame, got up and walked, would eventually be laid out flat again and not move. Lazarus, who comes out of the tomb, guess what? At some point, he went right back in. So, so, there are these miracles that Jesus performs, and they have a shelf life. Why does Jesus perform these miracles? Well, he wants to de demonstrate a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like, but he's also, he is demonstrating his credibility and his authority to perform the greatest of all miracles. Do you know what the greatest of all miracles is? Not that Lazarus can come out of the tomb, or that the blind person could see, or the deaf could hear, or the lame could walk again. The greatest of all miracles is that, is that a holy God could be reconciled to sinful creation and make our dead soul come alive again and, and God not compromise his holiness and yet our sin debt be paid for at the same time and that we could be reconciled to him through Jesus. That is the greatest of all miracles. The problem is we get so enamored with these miracles that have a shelf life that we don't focus on the greatest of all miracles. This is why, if you read the Gospels, when Jesus would perform miracles, he'd feed the 5,000, he would raise the dead, he would do these things, a, a crowd of people would follow him, and, and on he would go, and then he would stop, turn around, and preach a really hard message to all those people. And a big chunk of them would leave. You go, why would he do that? 
Because Jesus was very careful to make sure that he had lots and lots and lots of followers, but no fans. Jesus didn't want fans. He wanted followers. And he loved the fans enough to expose the fact that they were a fan by preaching a hard message. Because how do you know, what, what's the dividing line between who is a fan and who's a follower of Jesus? This will always be the dividing line when it costs you something to associate with Jesus. Fans leave. Followers pay the price and they keep going. And he loved the fans enough to help them see where they really were. Maybe you'll re-understand now the, um, the rich young ruler when he came to Jesus. So uh, he's, you know, why are you involving me in this? this? This may not be my time. Mom, I'm not here to do hocus pocus. Uh, then we get to verse number five. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, depending on how you read this, this might actually be one of the funniest verses in the whole New Testament. God in a bod. That's what Jesus is. God in a bod. He's all God. Never is he not the most powerful person in the room. And yet, Jesus' mother said, do whatever he tells you. It's, it's almost like it's, it's there in the Bible that teaches us that nobody in the room is ever more powerful than mama. She just knows, you know, hey, hey, you know, this is what I want. Let's make it happen. Do whatever he tells you. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, you've probably read the story before. This is not new information. But have you flipped the switch in your brain that invites your imagination to come alive? Because you are given detail. And you were not given detail because, you know, God was writing a term paper when he wrote this book and he needed some filler words. Every word is for our benefit. If, if we didn't need it, guess what? It wouldn't be here. So the fact that it is here is for our benefit. So we see there are six stone water jars. They were used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, which means these things are, typically get really dirty really quick. Six of them. Probably about yay high. Because we know each one holds 20 to 30 gallons of water. Anybody think they've got the brawn to pick up one of these stone water jars empty and move it? Nope. How about, how, how about filled up? Well, of course not. So, so we're given this detail as we understand that there's a big problem going on where they have run out of wine at the wedding. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so they filled them to the brim. That phrase, they filled them to the brim, underline that in your Bible. If you underline in your Bible, we're going to come back to that, and I think it's going to make sense to you why we're given that particular piece of information. So, so if I'm the servant in the story, I'm listening, and I hear all this murmuring. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, they, uh, they ran out of wine. Oh no, oh no, oh no. And, and, and I'm a servant, and I filled these six stone jars up earlier, and I'm listening to this, and I'm going, I wonder what they're going to do about all that. And then Jesus steps forward. He says, all right, we got a wine problem. Here's what we're going to do. See those stick stone water jars? Fill them up again. You want me to what? Those of you who, who uh, watched TV in the 80s, uh, I, I, if I was one of the servants in the story, I think I would be tempted to turn to Jesus and say, you know, uh, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> because from my perspective, we have a wine problem. Not a water problem. Hey, Jesus, newsflash. Fix the wine problem. We don't have a water problem. And if I'm serving the story, I'm probably going to say, I don't see with my eyes a problem. If someone were to say to me, hey, Brian, why do we see so little transformation in our churches? Here's what one of my answers would be. Because the American church is addicted to sight. I don't see how this is going to solve the problem. I don't see how this is going to fix it. And because I don't see how the outcome is going to uh, you know, fix whatever it is that's actually going on, I'm not sure I want to step forward in faith and obedience. I mean, after all, Jesus, like, do you realize how foolish I might look in this moment if we're trying to solve a wine problem and I'm filling up these water cisterns. And yet Jesus says, I want you to fill these things up. And think about it. There was no fire hydrant. 
There's no fire truck. There's no garden hose of any kind. How do you fill these things up? You grab a couple of buckets and you go on a one to three mile hike to the nearest well. Set it down, and there's the well. You look in there, you can't see the bottom of it. But you draw up the water that's there, pour it in. Draw up the water that's there, pour it in. You grab these two buckets. And guess what? Even empty buckets after the first mile are kind of uncomfortable. Can you imagine how uncomfortable these things are on the walk back? Like a half mile in, my arms would be on fire and feel like they're 10 feet long. And the whole time I muttered to myself, I don't see how this is going to solve the problem at all. So I get there, I pour the first one in, pour the second one in, I look inside that first stone jar and I go, that's it? All that time and effort, that's all I got to show for it? Back again. And I do that process over and over and over again and I finally, finally I'm able to pour uh, it in, fill that first stone water jar all the way up, and I go, this is going to take a whole lot of time and a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of energy. And because I'm probably going to function like I'm the lazy servant, my temptation is going to be that I'm going to, when it comes to stone jar two, at about 85% of the way full, I'm going to go, that's good enough. Third jar, 80, on down we go. If I'm feeling really spiritual that day, six stone water jar, I'm going to have a tape measure, and the moment I hit 50.5%, I'm rounding up. That's good enough. Because that's a whole lot of time and a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of energy when what Jesus is asking me to do does not make sense. And there are so many Christians who, who are standing at the starting line and having crossed and began to really run the race God has called them to run because to do so, they don't see how this path, this journey is, is going to result in the outcome that they're hoping for. It's asking more of their, uh, asking them to surrender their comfort, their convenience, and their control. I mean, if you're the servant in the story, all the time, effort, and energy to fill these six stone jars up, and it doesn't make sense to you. You don't see why you should even do this. And in the American church today, the trinity that we worship sadly more than the real one is comfort, control, and convenience. You threaten one of those three, and I pull back. And maybe that's why we're not seeing the level of transformation that we could and should. Because until we are willing to lay those aside and say yes to Jesus, we're never going to experience the transformation Jesus wants inside of us. And, and imagine being that servant in the story. So we got a wine problem. You want me to fill this up? This doesn't make sense to me. You're threatening my comfort. You're threatening my control. You're threatening my convenience. How am I going to handle this? You know, the temptation would be if, if, if you were to take an American Christian and plop them in the story as the servant, you know what they would be tempted uh, to say to Jesus? They would want to say, um, no, Lord. But you can't do that, can you? Do you know why you can't say no, Lord? Because the moment you choose to call him Lord, you can't use the word no. There's literally only one word you can put in front of that, isn't there? It's the word yes. And so when you look at that and you go, man, that's a lot of time, effort, and energy, and I don't see how this is going to make sense. I can't say no, Lord. So how do I say no, Lord, without saying no, Lord? The American church has found a way. Anytime something has come along your way that might threaten your comfort, your control, or your convenience. You and I have found the American way to say, no, Lord. It goes a little like, a little like this. <clears throat> I'll pray about that. Now, in every church, there's a small pocket of people that when they say they're going to pray about it, they go into their proverbial prayer closet, and they don't come out until they hear from God. And if God says jump, they say how high. Most of us, when we say I'll pray about it, we are lying. We never pray about it. It is just a way to say no, Lord, without saying no, Lord. And so six stone jars they got to fill these things up. It makes zero sense to them at all why they should be doing it. Next verse. 
Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside. And he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine for the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. So, so you finally get all six stone jars, you know, you put water in it. Again, remember, I'm the servant, so we're like getting less and less and less and less along the way. You're finally done with that. And you're going, I still don't see how this makes sense. And, and then Jesus says, I want you to scoop some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And again, I'm going, huh? Is, is, have you ever had this experience? Jesus asks you to do something. It doesn't make sense to you, but you do it. And then once you do it, you think you're done, only to find out you're not done. Okay, I, I, I did it, Jesus. All right. And he's like, all right, step two. And I'm going, what do you mean a step two? I thought it was step one and I'm done. Scoops him out and take it to the master of the banquet. Now, we know in the Bible that he changes the water into wine, right? And we'll talk about that more in a second. But here's what we don't know. It does not tell us in the text the precise moment the water turned into wine. Can I tell you what I think? This is thus saith Brian. I always want to preface that. Thus saith Brian. I think the servant in the story had to scoop out water and literally go on a faith walk. Here you go. Thinking he's going to be beheaded, thrown in jail, God alone knows what. I don't think that it was already wine. Because if I'm the servant in the story and I see this wine, I'm likely to take credit for this thing. Stick my chest out, kind of do a, you know, the swag walk. Here you go. You wanted wine? I got you wine. Here you go. Drink up. Drink up. I think it was water. And I think he had to literally, literally walk by faith. This doesn't make sense to me. This is not going to go good. Jesus, if you don't show up, if you don't do something, this is not going to go good. Do what only you can do. Here you go. I'm just going to be obedient to you. And listen, that's all he's ever asked you to do. He just wants you and I to be obedient to him. And if we will be obedient to him, he will order our steps. And listen, if you will be surrendered to Jesus Christ and simply walk by faith, he will assume responsibility for the outcome of every walk of faith you take. What keeps us from beginning the walk of faith is we go immediately to the outcome and we try to figure out in the natural realm how is this going to work. And if we don't see a solution that is to our benefit, we never take that first step. And we miss out on the opportunity to see the power of God unleashed on the man, woman, teenager, or child who's willing to walk by faith. I'm telling you, loved ones, he will assume responsibility for your every outcome if you just walk by faith. But we got this water, right? And it becomes wine. I don't, I don't want us to miss this. Wine takes a lot of time to develop, doesn't it? So let me tell you what Jesus did not do. Jesus did not say, as everyone's around, got the, you know, the six stone water jars, hey everyone, look, a bird! And everyone goes, Whoa, and he pulls out some red dye 40, puts some drops in, stirs it up, and he goes, oh, maybe there wasn't a bird. Look, we got wine! Jesus did not improve the water. He transformed it. Why is that important? Because every other religion in the world can only offer you behavioral modification type improvement. Every other religion can only at its best try and improve the version you already are. Christianity is the only religion in the world whose God says, I'm not going to improve you, I'm going to transform you, and I'm going to put my spirit and my power inside of you so that you can become what you never could become on your own. And that's why the name of Jesus is the only name that we praise, because he's the only one that can do that. And so, it's been transformed. The water has turned into wine. Now, I'm not going to use the clicker, but go back to that verse where it says, uh, I said, I underline that part and keep track of it. We're, we're at that moment now. So imagine I'm the lazy servant in the story, in the 100%, 85, 80, 50.5%. Jesus changes the water to wine. Here's my question. How much wine would there have been? 
the amount of wine would have been equal to the amount of water that was brought to him. In other words, the amount of transformation is equal to that which is brought to Jesus in the first place. Another way of saying this, Jesus cannot, will not transform what you won't bring to him. you got to bring what you have, not what you wish you had, but what you really do have, because Jesus, listen, listen, this is for someone today, Jesus cannot transform who you are pretending to be. He can only transform who you are today. But transformation only happens if you bring to him what you have. Now, I lived in Michigan now, I think it's about 17 years this month. And having been in Michigan long enough, I look at what Jesus did, and, and, and I almost want to go, Jesus, I think you made a mistake. Now, you've got to be careful when you say that. And here's the mistake. See, living in Michigan, I go, all right, they ran out of wine at the wedding. They have a big problem, don't they? And in Michigan, here's what I've learned. Here's what you taught me. There is no problem that Burner's ginger ale can't solve. So why didn't Jesus go, oh, ran out of wine, get the Burner's ginger ale, we can solve this in no time. Why did he ask for water? Because it was all they had. All Jesus is asking for is what you have. Just give me what you have, and I can transform that. And I can transform you and make you into something you could never be on your own. And when I look at this story, these six stone water jars, I kind of see them representing the totality of the transformation possible in Jesus. And I look at the well, and I see the well as a picture of the human heart. And I have to make that journey on a daily basis to the center of my own heart. And just like when you look down into a well, you can see what's on the surface, but you don't see what's really in there. The same thing is true with your heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? In other words, you don't understand your heart. You go, yes, I do. The fact that you would say, yes, you do, is proof that you are deceived, Scripture would say. So you don't even know really the depth of your own heart, but Jesus does. And he always saying, scoop out what you have. Just, just look at it, name it, and bring it to me. You go, I wish, I wish it didn't look like this. I wish it was better. I wish I was not still dealing with this issue any longer of brokenness and sin in my life. I hate to bring this before Jesus. Well, let me just tell you the good news of the gospel. It says that while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. He had a full picture view of every area of brokenness, dysfunction, depravity, and sin in your life. He saw it all crystal clear and said, I'll still die for that person. There is nothing you can bring to Jesus at any point in your journey by which you should be ashamed to bring it to him. He will not turn away from you. He will not cease to put his arm and his affection around you. He wants to transform you, but you need to come with boldness and confidence before the throne of God that you could receive the mercy that you need. So you draw up what's there, even if you don't like what's there, even if you should be well past this issue in your life, and you bring it to Jesus, and you pour it in. And through accountability, prayer, scripture, exercising spiritual disciplines like fellowship, God can begin to transform you. So, in a sense, you kind of go from that water, that dirty water, and into something beautiful like wine, fundamentally transformed at the soul level. So, if that's available to us, can you imagine what an insult it must be in heaven when somebody goes, well, that's just the way I am. I was born a worry wart. I am a worry wart. I'm going to die a worry wart. It's just the way I am. The phrase, that's just the way I am, should never come off the lips of a blood-bought son and daughter of the living God. Not when you have the same power in you that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. Like, that power is in you right now. So the issue is, are you in cooperation with it? Are you activating it? Are you allowing the totality of it to transform all of you so that all of them can see all of him and all of you? That's the goal, and that's what we live for. And so my question today is if these six stone jars represent the totality of the transformation possible in Jesus, where did you leave off? Where did you decide, just the way I am? 
Did you get about two stone jars there and go, you know what? That's good enough. I go to church. I serve. I'm part of this Christian subculture. I'm in Bible study every week. I'm learning all kinds of information. I've memorized all kinds of passages, and I serve in all kinds of ways. But I'm the same person I was five years ago, ten years ago, and fifteen years ago. Where would you leave off? What is the issue in your life that you've normalized and said, it's just the way I'm going to be? Is it greed? Is it control? Is it anger? Is it pride? Where is it that you stopped when there are six stone jars worth of transformation possible to you? Now, when you hear that, you go, well, okay, okay, yeah, Brian, boy, you're really beating me up and stepping on my shoes today. I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better. Well, the problem with that is at some point, you're going to go, oh, you know, I know I should do this, I know I should focus on this, but... uh, Comfort, control, convenience. They're going to come knock at the door and go, whoa, 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 you're threatening us. And you're going to go, well, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to back off. I'm going to back off. I'm going to back off. Because after all, who's it really going to affect? Just me. It's just me. When you really are touched by God, here's what will happen. You'll stop seeing things horizontally, and you'll start seeing things vertically. And realize it's not about you after all. As we go forward into what I think might actually be my favorite verse in the whole text, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs to which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Well, duh, you would too. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I was there. Oh, it's water. Oh, it's wine. I'm going with him. Why? Because wherever there is transformation, it always points to the fact that there had to have been a transformer. They did not need a class in apologetics. They didn't need to be persuaded. They didn't need the Romans road. They just needed to see transformation happen. And when they saw transformation happen, they instinctively went looking for a transformer. Now, we live in a day and a time where people outside the house of God, the family of God, seem to have very little interest in the things of God. And we can spend all day looking out at them and going, well, this sin and this issue, and they'll only get right with God. And I wonder if this moment in time that God has the church of Jesus Christ in, I wonder if we're squandering it looking out there instead of inside the family of God. Because people far from God have a history of over 2,000 years of whenever they see real transformation, they look for a transformer. And could it be that the people in your workplace, in your neighborhood, your friends, in your family, maybe part of the reason they seem so disinterested in a transformer is because they see so little transformation in those who are sitting in the seats in the house of God today. Because all throughout human history, you see transformation, you look for a transformer. Instead of being transformed to bring glory to God, we have been spending our time trying to sidle up to people who hold the same sort of positions we do politically and everything else, trying to consolidate and get power instead of actually allowing transformation to happen inside of us. It says there that he revealed his glory. The word glory in the Hebrew means weight, not like Brian, wait for dinner, but like lifting weights. Glory is the weight of the reality of who God is. And so he revealed his glory. In other words, the people who were there, they experienced the weight of the reality of who he was. Your life and mine is supposed to be one that gives God glory. In other words, wherever I go, in every human interaction, in every circle I am, I am to be on a journey of transformation so that as as I'm going from a one cistern to a two cistern to a three cistern, on my way to becoming a full six cistern Christian. Now, by the way, you're never going to fully arrive, so perfectionist, sorry. But the issue is, are you arriving today? As I am in pursuit of being a fully transformed vessel of Jesus, I am going to bring the weight of the reality of who God is into every one of my conversations, every one of my circumstances, in my neighborhood, in my work. I'll be giving God glory. So 
in the Gospels, Jesus makes all these claims. You know, I'm the way, implication, there's no other way. I'm the truth, implication, there's no other truth. I'm the life, implication, there is no other life apart from him. Um, and all, all throughout the Gospels, he makes these incredible claims. And so if you can imagine a set of scales, right? The issue is, here are all the claims of Jesus. Does your life give glory to Jesus? Does your life add weight on the scales to his claims? When people see you and the way you live and your pursuit of Jesus and all that he has for you, do they instinctively go, Jesus must be who he said he is because I see the weight of the reality of who he is in this person's life? Or are we living a comfortable Christian life where we're probably more moral than the people outside the family of God? We've got good behavior, but let me just free somebody up today. Jesus did not die to make you a good person. He died to transform you so that all of him and all of you could point all of them all to him for his glory. So church, as we get ready to take communion here in just a few short minutes, here's my question. Where did you leave off? And would you go back to the well again and again and again? And that thing that you've been trying to normalize and excuse away, well, it's just the way I am, it's just the way I am, it's just the way I am. Would you own it today and go to Jesus and say, listen, I'm sorry. You're offering me total transformation. And I spent the last 15 years of my life, 20 years of my life, being a two-cistern, two-stone jar Christian and saying, that's good enough. Renew my heart, oh God. So Lord Jesus, as we sit with this word today, we pray and we ask that you would, by your spirit, stir inside of this church today a newfound hunger and a thirst and a desire to see all the transformation possible take place in them. If ever there was a time, oh God, that we could not afford to keep playing church, it's now. So please, awaken us. Help us understand why we get to draw our next breath so that we can point people to you that they might see a transformation in us and assume that there must be a transformer who is responsible for it. God, I thank you that your spirit is way more specific than we like and that you are probably, even in this moment, you are naming issues, things. And you're bringing it to the surface and you're inviting us to go to the well May we go on that journey, may we surrender it to you, and may we experience total transformation so that the world around us would go, Jesus, he's a transformer because I see transformation happening in this thing called the church. May that be for your glory's sake and not ours.